Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Crystal Rose, and you are watching Melville, Moby Dick, and the Morgan. This is a Mystic Seaport for Educators presentation. If you're not familiar with Mystic Seaport for Educators, I encourage you to go to our new museum website for educators and students at educators.mysticseaport.org. As part of our um, initiative here at the museum, we're trying to make more of our artifacts and our staff knowledge accessible to people all over the world. So that's why we're now doing Google Hangout Teacher Professional Developments. And I hope and think that we probably have people joining us that are not only educators, but also um, maybe homeschoolers or families or students watching. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, just a little bit before we get started today, after Mary Kay speaks, um, we're going to be showing three artifacts from the collection that are related to Moby Dick. So it's very special. We'll pull them out. Mary Kay is going to get a chance to talk about the objects right here in the studio. Um, and after those uh, three objects are shown, we will take questions, um, both from our in-studio audience that we have here. We have a small group of teachers in our very tiny studio this afternoon. And we'll also take questions online. So I will be um, back at my computer and keeping up with questions that are coming in from the online audience. So feel free to, um, to shoot me a question. I'll keep it, and then I will ask it at the end of the program. Um, for those of you that are home or maybe tuning in from far away, if you are interested in um, this type of program, Mystic Seaport also has a new digital education initiative and we are offering virtual education programs. So if you're in California or Hong Kong, we can connect with you and treat you to a very special virtual program. Um, we have great um, live educators here. They, of course, they're alive, but we have educators here on staff and we do live programming using artifacts and our green screen here in our um, studio. So I hope that some of you guys will check that out. You can go to mysticseaport.org backslash learn and check it out under K through 12 programs. It's called uh, virtual programs. All right, so I'm going to introduce our speaker now. She is um, no stranger to us here at Mystic Seaport, but I'll read a little bit about her um, before she um, shares her incredible passion, very inspiring passion for Moby Dick with us here in the studio and online. Mary Kay Burkaw Edwards is Associate Professor of English and Maritime Studies, um, faculty at the University of Connecticut, an internationally known Herman Melville scholar and former president of the International Melville Society. She now serves as an editor for Leviathan, a journal of Melville studies. She is the author of Melville Sources and Cannibal Old Me, Spoken Sources in Melville's Early Works and the co-editor of Wilson Heflin, Herman Melville's Whaling Years. Dr. Bacall Edwards also serves as a demonstration squad foreman at Mystic Seaport Museum, where she spends her summers working high aloft on the museum's square rigged ships. A Coast Guard licensed captain, she has 58,000 miles at sea, all under sail. Last summer, she sailed aboard the 1841 whale ship Charles W. Morgan on its historic 38th voyage. The Morgan was built just seven miles away from the, and seven months after Melville's on whale ship Akushnet. So please welcome, uh, please help me in welcoming Mary K. Bracaw Edwards. Well, thank you, Crystal. So I, I'm going to give you a little bit of the life of Herman Melville first, and then um, I'll tell you about the writing of Moby Dick. But the inspiration for all of this was um, my uh, years, many, many years of about 32 years here at Mystic Seaport, climbing around on the Charles W. Morgan. Here I am with my two children. And as uh, Crystal said, um, the Morgan was built only seven miles away from and in the um, and uh, only seven months after Melville's own Akushnet. So since the Morgan's the only whale ship left in the world, it's pretty wonderful to be able to be on a ship that looks almost exactly like the one Melville sailed on. Here she is. Uh, as, as you see, she alone survives. So the only whale ship left in the world is one very much like Melville's. But to go back to Melville, um, Melville was born um, uh, on August 1st, 1819 in New York. And his early life, he was a, a New Yorker. His father was an importer of French goods, and uh, he um, made quite a, he was doing quite a nice living that way. Um, they had eight children. But then when Melville was 10, his father died. 
uh, his father went bankrupt, and when Melville was 12, he died in delirium, which was very tough for Melville to see as a child. Um, and it also meant that his mother was thrust into poverty with eight children, um, with nobody to uh, help her with uh, raising those. So because of that, he ended up going to sea as an ordinary sailor, something that one would not have expected for somebody of his um, social status. So he sailed um, at the age of 19 on board a merchant vessel named the St. Lawrence. He sailed from New York to Liverpool and back to New York. And uh, that was in 1839, as I said, when he was 19. And from that came his fourth book, which is called Redburn, and the subtitle of it is Being the Sailor Boy Confessions of the Son of a Gentleman, which is exactly what he was, the son of a gentleman um, who ended up going to sea. So he came home from that. He traveled inland to Galena, Illinois, traveled on a steamship, and from that came his 10th book, which is called The Confidence Man, um, and uh, returned uh, via, he traveled out via the Erie Canal and the Great Lakes and uh, returned home, and then finally, um, he signed on board the whale ship Akushnet. So he was at this time age 21. He signed on board on the 31st of December, 1840, and left on January 3rd, 1841, out of New Bedford. And of course, uh, this is the um, the vessel and the pa the voyage that made you know was the basis for Moby Dick. Um, when he was out there, uh, this is a whale ship at sea, um, a drawing by Barry Mosier, one of the illustrators of Moby Dick. And uh, when he was out there, uh, you know, he experienced what it was like to be on board a whale ship um, in good times and in tough times. Here you can see what it would be like when the uh, weather was just awful out there climbing aloft. This is uh, this picture was taken here at Mystic Seaport, and the person farthest on the right is myself. Um, but uh, that gives so it, it gives us a chance to feel what it was like for them. But they they were in terrible conditions often. He went down around Cape Horn up into the Pacific. Um, he also got a chance to see what it was like to spend time in whale boats. So uh, here uh, is one of the Mystic Seaport whaleboats sailing, but it, um, it gives you a sense of what it was like for them as well. So he experienced all those elements of whaling. And then they went into the Galapagos. Oh, oh, here's another shot. Actually, this is actually the Akushnet. This is a drawing of the Akushnet. There's only four known drawings, and this is one of them. Um, and this shows the boats uh, and uh, going after a whale there. Um, but um, from during that trip, he, he visited the Galapagos Islands aboard the Akushnet. And from that came um, 10 sketches that he wrote late in his life, which were called the Incantatas. Um, and uh, that um, they were published at first in magazines and then later as, um, as a book. So uh, then back out to sea again. Here's um, a little closer shot of the Akushna herself. Um, and uh, as you can see, of course, the, the whale boats around it. Um, and then one of the formative things that happened for them was that he stopped at the island of Nukahiva. The Akushna uh, stopped at Nukahiva um, and uh, on July 9th, 1842, um, Melville ran away. They, he, he deserted the ship. And um, five men deserted that day. and. The Akushnet did what many whale ships did when they needed the crew, when the crew had deserted. It went out to sea as if it was leaving, and three of the men showed themselves, and then the Akushnet came back in and recaptured those three sailors. But Melville himself escaped with a friend of his. And you can see what Nukahiva looks like from this shot. Uh, Nukahiva has these tall, steep mountains, um, steep valleys, and we actually are not positive what Melville did for that month. He was uh, on the island from July 9th until August 9th, 1842. Um, and uh, he wrote a book about it, a fictional book later, his first book, Taipei, published in 1846. Um, but what Taipei is a fictional piece, it's not necessarily what Melville did. So there's no documentary evidence except the, the, the date he deserted and the date he joined his next ship. Um, but we do know that he was amongst the Marquesan Islanders. And this is an a engraving that was done uh, shortly before Melville was on the island. Um, and it gives a sense of what the, the community looked like and what the, 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 uh, the islanders look like. You can see that there's also some Europeans in this um, engraving. 
but it gives you a little sense of the valleys that he was in amongst. Um, and then uh, another, another engraving done at exactly the same time. So it also gives you a sense of, of what it was amongst there. But um, then August 9th, um, 1842, he joined a, another whale ship, the Lucy Ann. She was a small Sydney whale ship, um, and she was inadequately officered. There was um, a captain, and uh, um, then there was a first mate, and there was no other officers except for an acting third mate. And who was a Polynesian. He had been a Polynesian, a harpooner who was, who was brought up to become acting third mate. And um, he, uh, so that uh, the fact that they called him acting third mate sort of took away some of his power. And um, so there was a lot of problems on this ship because of the inadequate officering that was going on. Uh, the, the captain became very sickly. The first mate was a, sort of a drunkard, which is understandable with all the stuff that was thrust upon him. And the men mutinied on that uh, ship. And um, Melville joined the mutineers later. They were put in a Tahitian jail. Uh, he was held in the Tahitian jail for a while. And then he escaped, which wasn't that hard to do from a Tahitian jail. Basically, he walked away one night and uh, went to the neighboring island of Morea and uh, wandered around Morea. So all those adventures of his, of his joining the Lucianne, um, his time uh, in the Tahitian jail, the mutiny of the Tahitian jail, and his wanderings on the next island, Morea, which they called Emio, um, would come out in his second book, Omu. So then from Omu, I mean, excuse me, from Morea, he joined his third whale ship. And this was the first one in which he had a lot of respect for the captain. The name of the vessel was the Charles and Henry. The um, captain was John B. Coleman Jr. And it was a Nantucket whale ship. And um, the captain treated the men well. They got enough to eat. Uh, in many ways, it was really good. The only trouble was that he wasn't very good at catching whales. So they, they didn't catch a lot of whales. But, um, and this is the place that Melville worked his way up to Harpunier. So in Moby Dick, um, uh, Ishmael is actually the bow oarsman. And um, in um, real life, Melville served as bow oarsman. Uh, but finally, he worked up to Harpunier on his third whale ship. And he, he was only signed on for the length of the passage, not for the length of the voyage. So he left the vessel in Hawaii. And um, then he, he did one, a very interesting thing. He, he set up pins in a bowling alley, something that we don't normally associate with Herman Melville. Mm -hmm. But uh, the fact was that if you think about uh, bowling alleys now, they have those little machines that put the pins up. But um, in, the day, in Melville's day, that, that resetting up of those pins was either done by children or by sailors. And sailors were considered very agile, so they could kind of run around in the back. So Melville did that, but eventually uh, he um, wanted to go home. Basically, he wanted to go home. So he joined the United States. Uh, she's a sister ship to the Constitution. She's the one that's closest to you in the photograph, uh, in, in engraving, I should say. Um, and um, she was uh, built at the same time as the Constitution. So even though the, the United States is long gone, the Constitution is still here, and you can get a sense of it. There were 470 men on board uh, that. And uh, Melville was on from um, the, he joined her um, in, uh, in there, and he was on board for 14 months. <laughs> he joined in May of 1843, and he was on board for 14 months until October of 1844. And um, though, during those 14 months, he actually witnessed 163 floggings. So that, that hatred of flogging, he himself was never flogged, but that hatred of flogging um, uh, really uh, runs through his fifth book, which is White Jacket. Um, and White Jacket is a set on board a man of war, a, a United States frigate, just, just um, like, which was called Never Sink in the Story, but it's based on the United States. So that, um, and that, that whole hatred of flogging and hatred of the, inhumane treatment of the sailors is it comes out in white jacket interestingly most naval vest, uh, stories have sort of um they break the tension of what it's like to be confined 470 men confined in, into a tight space by either having a battle or a storm but melville doesn't actually do either of those he doesn't give you a chance to break the tension he, he wants his concentration on how tough it was to be a sailor in the United States Navy. And the book was published in 1850, the same year that 
uh, flogging was abolished. Although the the publication of the book does not seem to have influenced the the law, they were both happening about the same time. So that was his end. He returns in October of 1844 to Boston, and that's the end of his time at sea. Um, but um, that uh, he did make another voyage later in his life on the clipper ship Meteor, uh, this vessel here, which was, he sailed with his um, younger brother Thomas, was the captain. And uh, so he makes it, he goes around Cape Horn um, and then uh, gets up to, the, to California, but he gets pretty homesick and he goes back home, not on the Meteor as expected, but via the Panama Canal. Um, and so the, it's, he's very unusual as a sailor because he sailed on four different types of vessels. So he sails first on the merchant vessel St. Lawrence, then he sails on three different types of whale ships, the, um, the Kushnet, the Luciane, and the Charles and Henry. Then later he sails on um, a naval vessel, the United States, and then at the end, towards the end of his life, he sails on the um, Meteor, a clipper ship, which is also a merchant vessel, but a, a different type. So, um, so he has a lot of experiences that he's going to bring to his writing. But there's another thing that happened as well. Um, this is the Summers, the Brig Summers, and his first cousin, uh, Gert Gansevoort, served as the first lieutenant on this USS Brig Summers under the commander the command of Commander Alexander Slidell Mackenzie. And the Summers is, quote, infamous for being the only United States Navy ship to undergo a mutiny, which led to executions. So on December 1st, 1842, a few days out of the Virgin Islands, the officers reported that they had, quote, come to a cool, decided, and unanimous opinion that midshipman Philip Spencer, who was the son of the Secretary of War, which was not, a that's, that's really important, the, the, the importance of his father. Uh, that midshipman Philip Spencer, uh, boatswain's mate Samuel Cromwell, and seaman Elisha Small were, quote, guilty of a full and determined intention to commit a mutiny. Um, and they recommended that the three be put to death. Despite Spencer's claim that the accused conspirators, quote, had been pretending piracy. The plotters were hanged that day and buried at sea. So, um, some have, uh, historians have been looking at this uh, uh, mutiny and uh, executions ever since. Um, some have noted that the captain could have waited since they were only 13 days out of their home port. And actually, they reached St. Thomas uh, only four days later on December 5th. Uh, so they say, why, why did the executions have to happen? Why, why he wasn't brought into a regular court? Um, the captain said that the, he noted the fatigue of his officers, the smallness of the vessel, and the inadequacies of the confinement on that ship. But when the, the Summers reached uh, St. Thomas on December 5th and then returned uh, to New York on December 14th, and she remained there during a naval court of inquiry, which investigated the alleged mutiny and the subsequent executions. The court exonerated Mackenzie, uh, as did a subsequent court martial that, that was held at his request. But there was a lot. The general populace remained very skeptical, and especially James Turner Cooper, uh, who, of course, is the author of The Last of the Mohicans, he wrote a full book uh, denouncing the, an, an investigation into the court martial denouncing Alexander Slidell Mackenzie for what he did. But the, the way that this is related to Melville is, of course, that his cousin, Gert Vansevoort, was one of the men in that drumhead court that made the decision to hang those three uh, men. And, um, and that he was still thinking about that almost 50 years later when he writes Billy Budd. So he writes Billy Budd at the very end of his life. He leaves it unfinished at his death. And um, it has also a supposed mutiny, a drumhead court, a hanging at sea. So that so that's why the summers is so uh, important to his life. Um, but to go back, so he returns home in um, in October of 1844, and his family, his mother is still doing in terrible shape. They have still have the eight children. Um, his mother had been part of the Dutch poltroon families, the, the upper class in in New York society. So she, in some ways, had married down a bit to marry his father, Ellen Malville. Um, and uh, she had not only never worked, she'd never not had servants to help her. So she she doesn't really have a good way of keeping this family going. And um, at least the stories are that that Melville uh, sat around telling stories of his adventures. And his family said, uh, Herman, you should write this down. So anyways, he starts um, a, a typee, his first book, uh, in 
um, 1845s, published in 1846. And it's an adventure story with uh, information that he's culled from other writers, which I'll talk about later with Moby Dick, and um, strung together. I've always thought of it sort of as a necklace with the beads of information strung upon it. And those, in, those bits of information <laughs> include Marquesan culture, Marquesan language, uh, a lot about tattooing. Um, and um, because there's a demand at this same time for useful knowledge, there, the publishers say that there's a whole new class of readers beginning around 1830. There's a huge growth in the reading public um, that, that has to do with the cheapness of making paper so that it's easier and cheaper to print newspapers um, and also to, to do with education movements. So one of the reform movements of the 19th century along with anti-slavery and women's suffrage and seamen's rights is also this idea amongst publishers that they have to give um, the right thing to these people, these new readers, these new educated uh, people. And um, there was even a society formed called the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. So, um, and so that partly is an inspiration behind the way he writes typey. Um, it appeared in two places. It appeared in the more purely factual narrative on John Murray's home and colonial library. That's his British publisher. And um, that Murray was worried that the story wasn't uh, wasn't true. Um, he was uh, he wanted it to be more informative. He thought it wasn't plausible. And uh, on the other hand, his American publisher John Wiley was worried that that Typey was too racy, and also worried about its serious criticism of the missionaries. So um, one of the things that inspired Meville was all the tattooing he saw in the South Pacific. You may associate tattooing with with um, uh, sailors, and partly that's because the sailors were exposed to tat tattooing all through the South Pacific. And Melville, he was, wasn't was sure exactly how he felt about it. He was worried um, about a man like this man in this engraving, Jean-Baptiste uh, Cabri. Uh, Jean-Baptiste was actually a, um, a, uh, uh, a Frenchman um, so that, uh, they, the, the, uh, he was a Frenchman who had run away. He was a beachcomber who'd run away on the South Pacific. And I think it's the next slide, if you would, Dan, um, the, that um, he had run away from a ship and married into a Marquesan family and allowed himself to be tattooed. So we'd become fully assimilated. And he spoke Marquesan. Um, and um, they, it, it, when Melville uh, met other sailors like him who had run away and become tattooed, he was sort of appalled because it was so permanent and meant that you could never return to your own family, your own society. Uh, so, so some of that comes out, some of those feelings come out in, um, in that book, uh, Typee. But um, his, his editor for this is Everett Dykink, who becomes incredibly important to his life. And um, after Typee is a, is a great success, he publishes his second book, Omu, uh, published in 1847, which is set in Tahiti. So the Marquesas have been very lightly missionized at this point, but but the South Pacific has, I mean, uh, Tahiti's been heavily missionized. And uh, so Omu, consequently, is much tougher on uh, the missionaries than Typee. So Omu, um, is published and uh, John Wiley, it was quote, too strong for the agitated conscience of John Wiley and actually was published therefore by the Harper brothers who become Melville's major um, publishers. Uh, but one of the great things uh, that happens with all this is his meeting with uh, uh, Dyke Kink. Another great thing that happens is he, that he feels comfortable enough to get married. So he marries Elizabeth Shaw, the daughter of the Chief Justice of Massachusetts, Lemuel Shaw. And um, they move in in New York City into a house with his brother Alan, Alan's wife Sophia, and his mother and four unmarried sisters. And they, they're all living together in this tiny house. And uh, um, Alan's a lawyer, so he goes out to a law office, but Melville's trying to write in this, uh, this atmosphere. Um, the other thing that happens with these young married couples is that they start to have babies. So the house is even more, uh, more um, crowded. But because of his relationship with Dykink, he starts to read. Dykink lent him many books, and he read Sir Thomas Brown, Robert Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, uh, Rabelais. He writes of Sir Thomas Brown. Uh, he he talked to Everett Dykink about Sir Thomas Brown, 
Um, and um, Dykink writes to his brother, by the way, Melville reads old books. He has borrowed Sir Thomas Brown of me and says finally of the speculations of the Religio Medici that Brown is a kind of cracked archangel. Was ever anything of this sort said before by a sailor? Which is a, a quote I love because, of course, as myself, as a sailor, I'm like, yeah, we can say smart things. But uh, so, so those are his first two books. They, Omu doesn't do as well as Typee, but um, it still does pretty well. And then he starts his third book, which becomes drastically changes in the middle. It's be, it begins of the story of his time on the Charles and Henry, but it becomes this allegorical voyage. It's called Marty, published in 1849, and basically it doesn't do well. Um, uh, so the other thing that happens is he starts reading Shakespeare. He's gone up to, the, to Boston with his wife, um, and uh, so Lizzie, who, who's about to give birth to their first child, and up there he, he starts to read Shakespeare, and he writes to Dykink. I have been press, passing my time very pleasantly here, but chiefly in lounging on a sofa and reading Shakespeare. It is an addition and glorious great type. Every letter whereof is a soldier in the top of every tee like a musket barrel. Dolton ass that I am, I have lived more than 25 years, 29 years, and until a few days ago never made close acquaintance with the divine William. Ah, uh, he's full of sermons on the mount and gentle eye, almost as Jesus. I take such men to be inspired. If another Messiah ever comes, twill be in Shakespeare's person. I am mad to think how minute a cause has pr prevented me hitherto from reading Shakespeare. But until now, any copy that was come addable to me was um, was hap uh, happened to be in a vile small print, unendurable to my eyes, which are tender as young sparrows. But chancing to fall in with this glorious edition, I now exult over it page after page. So he's totally excited about this reading of Shakespeare. But with a family, uh, an, a growing family, um, he, he and Marty not doing well, he has to write some books that will sell. So in one summer, he writes Redburn and White Jacket. In four months, he writes the two of those books. Redburn's the one based on his first voyage on the St. Uh, Lawrence uh, to Liverpool and back. And White Jacket, of course, is based on his time on the United States. Uh, in my edition, uh, um, uh, White, uh, Redburn is 390 pages, White, White Jacket's 465 pages, so he writes all that. Um, but things were about to change. He and his family moved up to the Berkshire Mountains of Massachusetts, and um, there on, uh, August, uh, on August 5th, 1850, um, he, uh, Dykink came to visit him up there and brought along with him some other literary lights of the, uh, of the world, of uh, the United States at the time. So with, the, with this group, he climbs Monument Mountain. Um, and this happened on the 5th of August, 1850. There were 10 people involved, and five of them have written letters or journals or accounts of it. So we have a, a great sense of what happened. So it's Melville, Everett Dykink, as I said, the center of the New York literary world. Uh, Cornelius Matthews, who's known as the author of Kalua and other forgettable books. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes who wrote, of course, uh, um, Chambered Nautilus and Old Ironsides. Uh, David Dudley Field, who was a local author, and Miss Jenny Field. Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, James T. Fields, who was a publisher and also an author, and his wife, Annie Fields, who's actually become more and more known over time. Um, uh, and then a young man, Harry Sedgwick, who was the only one amongst the eight men who had not yet written a book. But of course, amongst that crowd, he would then go on to write a book. So um, this is his meeting with Hawthorne. So his, as I said, he's moved up with his family to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, to Arrowhead, which you can still visit. You can actually see the study in which he wrote Moby Dick. And, um, he, um, and his, his brother, Alan, stays behind, but his mother and unmarried sisters all move up with him. So they're all crowded together in a farmhouse up there. Um, but he, he's rereading Shakespeare, as I said, and he's, and he's, meets Hawthorne, and that changes everything. So he had started Moby Dick that spring and um, had, had written um, on the 7th of August, only two days after this, he writes and says uh, to his uh, publisher and says, I have a new book mostly done, but it's actually not published until November of 1851. So he had said he was going to write a romance of the sperm whale fishery, but it actually takes him a very long time to write that. So a lot of this is Hawthorne. So here's one of the letters that he writes to, to Hawthorne in that amazing summer. 
the calm, the coolness, the silent grass growing mood in which a man ought always to compose. That I fear can seldom be mine. Dollars damn me and the malicious devil is forever grinning in upon me, holding the door ajar. My dear sir, a presentiment is on me. I shall at last be worn out and perish like an old nutmeg grater, grated to pieces by the constant attrition of the wood. That is the nutmeg. What I feel most moved to write, that is banned. It will not pay. Yet other altogether write the other way I cannot. So the product is a final hash and all my books are botches. It's really interesting that he's writing that in the middle of writing, you know, a Moby Dick. Um, and he, uh, he also says in the same letter, until I was 25, I had no development at all. From my 25th year, I date my life. Three weeks have scarcely passed at any time between then and now that I have not unfolded within myself. That sounds pretty positive. But then he goes on to add, he's not, he's only 30 at the time. And he says, but I feel that I'm now come to the inmost leaf of the bulb and, and that shortly the flower must fall to the mold. So, so you can see that kind of deep depression and, and, um, inside of him and sort of uncertainty about it. But at the same time, he's writing this magnificent book um, and uh, uh, published uh, in, in November of 1851. Um, Moby Dick is dedicated to Hawthorne. And Hawthorne, so Melville sent him a copy. And Hawthorne sent him back a letter, which no longer exists. Um, I've always thought if there's one thing I would like to go back in time to do, it's to see this letter. But we have. Uh, Melville's response. So Melville receives the letter from Hawthorne and he sits down and instantly writes back. He calls it, I'm only going to quote parts of it, but he calls it your joy giving and exaltation breeding letter. A sense of unspeakable security in me is in me this moment on account of your having understood. I have written a wicked book and feel spotless as the lamb. You were archangel enough to, to, um, to despise the imperfect body and embrace the soul. Lord, when shall we be done growing? As long as we have anything more to do, we have done nothing. So now let us add Moby Dick to our blessing and step from that. Leviathan is not the biggest fish I have heard of Krakens. So of course the, the Leviathan is, is uh, another name for wh the whale and then Kraken are, is another name for uh, the giant squid. And then he stops the letter and then he writes, P.S. I can't stop you and he keeps going. Um, so he has this moment where, where um, Hawthorne understands what he has created, and that is fantastic to him, but nobody else really does. So uh, between the publication in 1851 and Melville's death in 1891, um, they never even sell out the first printing of, of the first English printing. Uh, the American, uh, they never sell out the first edition of the American edition. It's only published in the first American and first English edition. So there's not another edition of it till, until 1891 after Melville dies. Um, so the rest of his life is quite sad. Uh, he spends, uh, he, he tries to write a few more pieces. His 10th book um, is, um, is um, The Confidence Man, published out about 1857. And then he ceases to write uh, prose. He writes poetry, and his poetry has been rediscovered, and there's more and more thoughts about how good his poetry is. But at the time, um, there, it, it, it's not much read. Um, and then he spends the last 19 years at the end of his life as a customs inspector in the Port of New York. So he looks at uh, items as they come in and checks them off. Um, so when he died, um, in, uh, interestingly, uh, when he died, there was not surprise. Oh, 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 I forgot. Uh, I'm going to step back here a moment. Uh, he does right after Moby Dick. When Moby Dick doesn't do very well, um, he decides he's going to write a book that will sell. And he thinks that a domestic romance is what will do it. You know, he notices how these romances are bought by women and he wants to write, write for them. But he just gets it wrong. He says to Sophia Hawthorne, Hawthorne's wife, but my dear lady, I shall not again send you a bowl of salt water. The next chalice I shall commend will be a rural bowl of milk. But as many critics have said, the rural bowl of milk curdled. Um, he, Pierre was published in 1852. Uh, it's a story of incest, love, love triangle, murder, suicide. His father-in-law said of it, Herman has out Williamed William. There are more dead bodies at the end of Pierre than there are at the end of Hamlet. And I'll read you one of the reviews uh, by George Washington Peck in the American Whig Review. A bad book, affected in dialect, unnatural in conception, repulsive in plot, and inartistic in construction, such as Mr. Melville's worst and latest work. So another, another, um, review began Herman Melville crazy. 
So because of that, that as well as uh, everything else, he publishes The Confidence Man, and then he ceases to, uh, to write prose. Um, and as I said, the, the ending of his life is very sad, but there was an, an interesting moment. He went um, to, um, to England, and Hawthorne had become the Liverpool Council, the Council, American Council of Liverpool, and Hawthorne writes of their meeting there. And he says, a week ago last Monday, Herman Melville came to um, see me on, um, at the consulate, looking much as he used to do, a little paler and perhaps a little sadder. Melville has, been, has not been well of late. He has been affected with neurologic complaints in his head and limbs. His writings for a long while past have indicated a morbid state of mind. So he invites him. Um, uh, Hawthorne invites Melville to uh, visit his family in Southport. And there, there is a long beach that's uh, kind of little vegetation on it, sort of sand dunes. And they go for a long walk there. But first he writes, um, and accordingly, he did come the next day, taking with him by way of luggage the least little bit of a bundle, which he told me contained a nightshirt and a toothbrush. He is a person of very gentlemanly instincts in every respect, save that he is a little heterodox in the matter of clean linen. <laughs> Hawthorne clearly felt that he should have bought more clothing with him. But, but here's the important part. They're walking amongst those hills, and he writes, Melville, as he always does, began to reason of providence and futurity and of everything that lies beyond human ken and informed me that he had pretty much made up his mind to be annihilated. But still, he does not seem to rest in that anticipation, and I think will never rest until he gets hold of a definite belief. I knew um, uh, uh, it is strange how he persists, and has persisted ever since I knew him, and probably long before, and wandering to and fro over these deserts, as dismal and monotonous as the sand hills amid which we were sitting. He can neither believe, this is the really important part, he can neither believe nor be comfortable in his unbelief, and he is too honest and courageous not to try to do one or the other. If he were a religious man, he would be one of the most truly religious and reverential. He has a very high and noble nature and better worth immortality than most of us. So probably the single most important thing that was said about Melville, and if you think about that, he can neither believe nor be comfortable in his unbelief. That's certainly the inspiration behind Moby Dick. That's what's going on there. But as I said, most people had uh, didn't realize even that he was still around. And the obituary that came out uh, right after he died is very sad to read. There died yesterday at his quiet home in the city, a man who, although he had done almost no literary work during the past 16 years, was once one of the most popular writers in the United States. Herman Melville probably reached the height of his fame about 1852, his first novel having been printed about 1847. So he's slightly off in the dates, but very close. Of late years, Mr. Melville, probably because he had ceased his literary acti activity, has fallen into a literary decline, as a result of which his books are now little known. And then this very sad last line. Probably, if the truth were known, even his own generation has long thought him dead. So quiet have been the later years of his life. So that is the, uh, you know, sort of the end of, um, of his life there. Um, and, and, and it's often, when I think about it, it's very sad life to sort of think about. But the good part to me, the part that, that makes me feel, you know, not as sad about it is the fact that he did have Hawthorne and that Hawthorne read Moby Dick and, and somehow understood some of what uh, Melville was writing. So now I want to talk a little about how the book was written. Uh, it's published in 1851. Uh, here's what it looks like in the first edition, first American edition. Um, pretty not <laughs> unimpressive. So um, there's the uh, Melville Society has a first American and a first uh, British edition. The first British edition was uh, a three-decker, but both of them are pretty unimpressive, sort of. Um, you can tell by these covers this, that Melville is not much of uh, what, no, they're not going to spend much money on him at the time. But these books, this first American edition is worth a lot, but if you can get a first British edition, which only had a, a, a issue of something like 250 copies, that's worth a lot of money now. Um, so I want to talk about what inspired him to write it. So of course, his, the first thing I'll talk about is his time at sea. Um, you know, as I said, he spent four years at sea and served on three different whale ships. And the whale ships are interesting in many ways. They are more isolated than anything that we can even imagine now. You think about somebody in space, and even being in space, um, they are connected, you know, they can call Houston. Um, 
but their uh, whale ship is uh, the average voyage with two to five years. They are so far away from anything for such a long period of time that they that have this absolute isolation. But the other thing that happens is they have this close community of the sailors, and they um, learn. Uh, they, you know, talk. They have nothing much else. There's the, about a quarter, roughly. There's a lot of study been done of this, but about and there's many different figures. But the one that uh, with my research that I think is probably about the closest for whalemen is about uh, um, about uh, a quarter of them are literate and uh, I, I, I mean about a quarter of them are illiterate and about a quarter of them are barely literate so about half of them are literate so even those uh, there's so there's many of them who can't read or write but even those that can there's very little to read or write so they develop this close kind of oral spoken world and Melville spent all that time at sea and, and that partly developed his quality of being a great storyteller. And if you listen to Moby Dick out loud, um, it's astounding how well it sounds out loud because uh, he's got that storyteller voice. And, um, and so that comes from all these years of telling his story. Um, and um, another thing about them is that whalemen are exposed to nature sort of at its most sublime. They're, they're so far from land, and they're dealing with the largest creature that's ever lived. So that also is an inspiration to them. Uh, Melville says, wrote at the very beginning of Moby Dick, chapter one, I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. Not ignoring what is good, I am quick to perceive a horror and could still be social with it, would they let me, since it is but well to be on friendly terms with all the inmates of the world one lodges, the place one lodges in. So um, he also had a lot of experience in whale boats. And whale boats are pretty small. I'm going to show you some great shots that we have later on that was taken on the Morgan voyage this summer of us in whale boats right next to the whales. Um, but uh, that, that gave them an even more sort of intense relationship with um, the sea and with the, the um, whales. And uh, Ishmael asks uh, Stubb, the second mate, in reference to Starbuck, the first mate after the after the first lowering, after the first time they lower for whales in Moby Dick, in, this is in chapter forty nine. He says, "Mr. Stubb, I think I have heard you say that all whalemen you ever met uh, that of um, I think I have heard you say that of all whalemen you have ever met, our chief mate, Mr. Starbuck, is by far the most careful and and prudent." I suppose then that going plump on a flying whale with your sail set in a foggy squall is the height of a whaleman's discretion. So that that's that uh, yeah that feeling of it, um, and also you know whales crunched up boats. They carried two spares on an average whale ship, and uh, they had uh, four to five whale boats hanging from the side and two spares because they expected that they were going to be thrashed around by the whales. Uh, here's a, a an image from Melville's time of a whale crunching a whale boat. Um, and uh, Starbuck says in uh, the, the chapter, the quarter deck chapter um, to uh, Ahab, he says, um, I, when Ahab asks, are you not game for this? And uh, um, Starbuck says, I am game for his crooked jaw and for the jaws of death too, Captain Ahab, if it barely comes in the way of business we follow. But I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. So. Um, he was also inspired, um, so he has his time at sea and also um, art that he's seen from his. This is from uh, the Garneret, um, which was, uh, it was called Cachalot Fishery. Garneret was a, a French uh, artist. Um, and then it was later, the way most people know this, uh, this image is uh, because Courier and Ives then engraved it later. Um, but this is what uh, Melville writes about it in um, chapter 56. But taken for all in all, by far the finest, though in some details not the most correct, presentations of whales and whaling scenes to be anywhere found are two large French engravings, well executed and taken from paintings by one Garneret. So, um, so we have that. But all this time, this time on the whale ship, but especially in these whale boats, and experience it comes out in this wonderful, wonderful, um, haunting passage at the end of the first lowering. So in the first lowering, they um, they get uh, they get their the whale boat that um, Ishmael's in gets swamped and left behind by the the ship and uh, they have to spend the night uh, in this and you can see this is the Rockwell Kent uh, illustration of it you can see that they've got water all over their feet um, and this great quote that you can see uh, um, in the photograph and I'll read as well 
so cutting the lashing of the waterproof match keg after many failures, Starbuck contrived to light, ignite the lamp and the lantern. Then stretching it on a wave pole, handed it to Queequeg as the standard bearer of, the for, of this forlorn hope. There then he sat, holding up that imbecile candle in the heart of thy, that almighty forlornness. There then he sat, the sign and symbol of a man without faith, hopelessly holding up hope in the midst of despair. So, so, the, so he takes, um, and, and this is seen all the way through Moby Dick, I just uh, centered on here, is time on the wheel boats and how, and how he transfers that into creating Moby Dick. Another thing that he experienced out there was sailor demographics. So the sailors, um, there's a many of the sailors from Nantucket and New Bedford, but he also encountered sailors who had um, come from uh, the different island groups. So these are, this is a drawing that came out in Belize uh, magazine in 1855. And these are South Sea Islanders uh, that um, are from, uh, that are in Sydney, Australia. But you can see that they still have their hair. They still have the kind of South Sea Island hair, but they've, they're they putting on sailor clothing. And sort of they're, they're um, islanders in the transition stage, much like Queequeg is. Um, he also, uh, this is from the Morgan, this is George Parkin Christensen on the left. He's the great grandson of Fletcher Christian, the leader of the Bounty Mutineers. He served on the Morgan for at least 12 of the 14 voyages between 1893 and 1913. But I include him also as another example of an islander uh, that, that uh, the type of islander Melville might have acquired. And um, these lead, of course, to Queequeg. So um, Queequeg, uh, uh, Ishmael's comrade in Moby Dick. He's from the island of Coco Voco, which Melville tells you is not down on any map. True places never are. But uh, he he's heavily tattooed. Actually, if you read the descriptions of him closely, he sounds very Marquesan. Uh, the way his hair is, the descriptions of the tattoos, which makes sense because, of course, the place that Melville spent the most time amongst uh, Polynesian islanders was um, uh, in the Marquesas. And so this is the Ishmael's first sight of Queequeg. Uh, he turned around with good heavens, what a sight, such a face. It was of a dark purplish yellow color, here and there struck over with large blackish looking squares. Yes, it's just as I thought, he's a terrible bedfellow. He's been in a fight, got dreadfully cut, and here he is just from the surgeon. But that moment he chanced to turn his face so towards the light that I plainly saw that they could not be sticking plasters at all, those black squares on his, on his cheeks. And then that, that's when Ishmael realizes that they are tattoos. And at first he thinks that uh, Queequeg is a sailor who's been tattooed in the South Pacific, much like Jean-Baptiste Cabri, whom I shall do earlier. But uh, it finally comes to him that he is, in fact, a South Pacific Islander. So that's one, another yet another inspiration behind Moby Dick. Um, and then, um, of course, one of the biggest, the one I've spent a lot of time of my life studying, is Melville's uh, reading. Uh, so Melville consumed books and was consumed by them. Uh, as he read, he argued with them, laughed and cried over them, exulted in them, became fiercely angry with them. His, his copy of Milton is just wonderful. He's like, no, he writes all around the edges and, and he's arguing away. Um, uh, he fills it with notes and jotting, slashing pen marks, furious periods. Uh, this is what he writes at the beginning of his Dante. What execrations. What hatreds against the human race, what exultation and merriment at eternal sufferings. In this view, the Inferno is the most immoral and impious book ever written. And he quote, he quoted that from Walter Savage Landor at the beginning of copy of his at his copy of Dante, and he adds, Thus savagely writes Savage Landor of the still more savage Tuscan. Um, so he's always kind of responding emotionally to the books that he's read. Um, and uh, he he had some informational sources. Thomas Beale's The Natural History of the Sperm Whale is one of his most important informational sources. Uh, he also read J. Ross Brown's Etchings of a Whaling Cruise, um, William Scoresby, An Account of the Arctic Regions. And Scoresby, not only does he read from him, but he spends much of Moby Dick making fun of Scoresby. Uh, he calls him Captain Sleet, an exclamo Dr. Zogranda, a famous authority on smells named Vogel von Slock, and Professor Dr. Snothead of the College of Santa Claus and St. Potts. So he'll, he'll steal, or Melville scholars prefer the term borrow. Other people might say steal, plagiarize, take. We, we say borrow. Um, uh, and from Scoresby, stick it in Moby Dick, and then make fun of him on top of that. 
of course, another major source is Owen Chase's narrative of the most extraordinary and distressing shipwreck of the whale ship Essex. Um, but even Cetology, uh, the chapter uh, uh, that is taken almost word for word from this, uh, volume 27 of the uh, Penny Cyclopedia, put out by the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. Um, but he appropriated book, blocks of writing that we can tell not only what book he read, but what edition, um, because uh, there's these fingerprints, such as uh, 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 misspellings, uh, uh, the peculiar wordings, um, uh, errors in dates, uh, things like that. Um, but yet, somehow, uh, he transforms it. So um, I've just given you the informational sources. He also has, has sort of literary sources. The most important, of course, is the Bible, followed by Shakespeare, especially King Lear, followed by Milton and then Dante. Um, he also uses Carlyle's Sardorosaurus, uh, uh, Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, Goethe's Faust, Rotten Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, Pierre Bale's Historical and Critical Dictionary, Montaigne's Essays. They all are there throughout the book. Um, and um, but somehow he takes these works, especially his informational sources, and he transforms them. He in, invests them with humor, and um, they become much greater than than the the boring source that they came from. Uh, T. S. Eliot wrote, "One of the surest tests is the way a poet borrows. Immature poets imitate. Mature poets steal." Mm -hmm. So I would argue that that Melville, in this case, is a mature poet. <laughs> and then. Of course, as I said earlier, the, the influence of, of, um, of uh, Hawthorne cannot be understated. So he has these long talks with Hawthorne. And he, you know, he, as pa Hawthorne said in that letter I read you earlier, he reasons of providence and futurity and all things that lie beyond human ken. Human ken in that no uh, 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 meaning human knowledge. Um, and so those uh, go together to make um, the character of Ahab. Uh, so finally, you know, we spend much of the book waiting for Ahab to come out. And then there's one of my favorite lines in the whole book, reality outran apprehension. Captain Ahab stood upon the quarter deck. Um, he, when he first appears, uh, Melville writes that he looked like a man cut away from the stake. So powerfully did the whole grim aspect of Ahab affect me and the, uh, and the livid brand which streaked it. Um, uh, streaked it that his whole body, his whole body has this um, brand that seems to go from the top down to his toe. Um, that for the first few minutes, I hardly noted that not a little of this overbearing grimness was owing to the barbaric white leg upon which he partly stood. And then later on, um, Ahab, you know, Ahab is the one who's trying to tell um, Ishmael, the crew, why they're going out after Moby Dick. And uh, he cries out, all visible objects man are as but pace, uh, all visible objects man are but as pasteboard masks. If man will strike, strike through the mast. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall shut near to me. So that his great so he thinks somehow Ahab believes that in his um, the going after the whale, he will somehow be able to get at all the things that we as humans never can tell the you know humans are confined by the five sentences five senses to the world that we know and, and that totally frusts Ahab so he's frustrated and frustrated and frustrated with that and he keeps thinking you know madly he's uh he says um he says I am you know he says I'm not mad I am madness maddened maddened I am demoniac he cries out um and um he but somehow he believes that if he can thrust through that wall, uh, kill that whale, then he will get at this knowledge or truth or, or you know, some kind of understanding that we have. So of course he's a pure Promethean figure um, and never does is able to get through that wall. So I thought I would end my little writing of Moby Dick section with something a little less uh, traumatic and uh, dramatic than um, than uh, I have here. So this is um, a, a cartoon that came out in Vanity Fair in 1861, and it shows the uh, grand ball given by the whales in honor of the discovery of oil wells in Pennsylvania. So, of course, oil was discovered in Pennsylvania in 1859, Titusville, Pennsylvania, and that leads to the declining whaling, as well as the Civil War beginning in 1861, um, and all those lead uh, to, to a decline. So, 
I'm going to go from there into um, uh, the 30th voyage of the Charles W. Morgan, um, which I was lucky enough to be able to sail on the, the staff here at Mystic Seaport. Uh, each, uh, those who wanted to, uh, each spent one third of the voyage on board. Um, and for me, as a Melville scholar, it was unbelievable to get a sense. I, I'd spent about 30 years climbing a loft on the ship, so I had a sense of what it was like to set in, sails on it. In fact, in this picture, I'm up at the very top, it's top sail, the top highest mast, uh, trying to push the yard up because it was kind of stuck and we knew that they were taking pictures and we wanted it to look good. Um, but, um, and I had had uh, raced and lowered whale boats and rode in whale boats, but it just not the same as going to sea. So here we are heading down the river, May 17, 2014. Um, there, the, there's uh, two tugs taking the Morgan and right behind her are all the whale boats coming, following her. And you can see the number of spectators. It was pretty fantastic, uh, just unbelievable. Here we are going through the Mystic Drawbridge, the railroad bridge, um, and the whale boats you can see right behind. So I was in, in uh, that lead whale boat. We are rowing right after the Morgan. And that uh, we had five whale boats. So that was pretty spectacular. Um, and then we're, this is up on her first of uh, her first sea trials, uh, looking up aloft. Um, we were just, you know, we had all these ideas about what it would be like. And uh, we had, I'd spent 30 years talking about uh, what the Morgan was like. You know, I kept telling everybody that she was tubby and fat and that she just wouldn't sail very fast, you know, and that they averaged three to five miles per hour. We <laughs> spent so many years doing that, but somehow nobody had told the Morgan that. So we went out to sea and she hit seven and a half knots on her first day. She hit eight and a half knots going into New Bedford, and she would have gone faster than that uh, if they, they except they, the captain didn't want to put too much stress on her. So here's another sea trial. You can see us pulling away um, on those lines. And um, one of the things about her was that she just was so much, so much faster and swifter than we ever believed that she would be. So that was a huge revelation. I think probably for myself, and a lot of uh, Melville scholars sailed on it. We had a, this uh, a program called the 38th Voyagers, and there we took 85 um, voyagers, including teachers, artists, um, scholars, um, anthropologists, ethnomusicologists, all um, different types of people on, out as, as part of the program, and uh, including a lot of Melville scholars. And that, I think, was probably the biggest thing for all of us, was that she was so nimble, so swift, and she turned so quickly, um, had not expected that at all. So that kind of changed the way we thought about the hunt for the whales. Um, so here she is uh, in Martha's Vineyard, one of our uh, first stops. Uh, we went to Newport and then to Martha's Vineyard. And then from there, we sailed into uh, New Bedford, which was magnificent. She had left New Bedford in um, 1941 and had not been back since. Uh, and there is now a hurricane barrier um, that across the entrance to the harbor, but um, that still we were under sail. The tugs are next to her, but actually she was under sail for this. The captain wanted her sailing. He just had the tugs there just in case because that 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 hurricane barrier is a pretty narrow entrance. And um, then as soon as we got in, right through the barrier, then he was like shouting all out to all of us to get those sails down. So we had to get them down very quickly uh, because we didn't want her to keep charging that much. But um, it, it was uh, astounding. And we also found out why New Bedford was the major port that it was when Melville sailed, uh, because it's got the, a nice, straight, clean entrance from the, uh, the Atlantic, um, from the North Atlantic. It also is protected. Uh, the wind is uh, the, the the worst of the winds come out of the north and the northeast and that is the way that it's protected but from the south um, it's that's with the way the ships go in and out so so you get there and um, you can see the whole description that Melville has of New Bedford and Moby Dick was became clear uh, to sail it here we um, had uh, the the Morgan there was a parade that went by it um, uh, as you can see on June 29th and um, there were 250 vessels that joined the parade, but the first 19 vessels were whale boats. 10 of them built for the Morgan and then nine of the local uh, whale boats from New Bedford. So I always like this picture because they look a little like uh, those water bugs skittering out across the top. But um, it was, you know, it was magnificent for the people of New Bedford and as well for us. Um, and then uh, we uh, 
went up to Provincetown, um, and the whale, whale ship sailed out of Provincetown. The Morgan actually couldn't go in far enough to tie up because she was too deep. Uh, so she had to be anchored out. But um, it, you know, just gave a sense of being there, uh, you know, more, all these things uh, made me realize more what it was like to, to um, be on board a whale ship. The other thing that was interesting to me uh, as part of, I was part of the uh, staff crew, uh, they were called, we were called the staff sailing deckhands, and how hard we worked. We never stopped. Uh, they just, we worked constantly, and that was another idea I had not had was how hard the whalemen worked. Now I think when they were out in a long passage, uh, where you would set the sails and leave them set and and braced in one way, uh, you know, when the winds are pretty steady, once you get farther offshore, they probably wouldn't have worked quite as hard. But I had this image of whalemen often in kind of a sleepy um, times without much going on, and that kind of changed too. So all these things were wonderful for me as a Mevel scholar. But of course, the most magnificent was being able to go down and row amongst the whales on Stellwagen Bank. Um, so here you see the on uh, we have the Mystic Whaler that accompanied us and the Roan, which is Mystic Seaport's own vessel. Um, and uh, so you can see first that this whale is is pretty close. Um, my brother is the, was the second mate of the trip, Sean Burka, and he's uh, steering this whale boat. Um, and then uh, the whales came closer and closer. <laughs> and I, uh, I was asked once if, the, if they were posing in the lower part of the picture. You see everybody push, that's pointing, and it's like, no, nobody was posing. <laughs> that was all pure uh, reaction. Um, and then uh, even closer, and then suddenly there were two. So, um, and uh, this uh, just couldn't get over how close these whales were. Now, one of the things that happened was it all seemed so cool and exciting to be able to sail on a whale ship and be on board with a whale boat and lower the whale boat and row amongst the whales. And then to be actually right next to the whales, it was like, this is really scary. These guys are a lot bigger than uh, the whale boat is. So, uh, you can see here, getting much closer, and uh, then even even closer here. Um, so, and finally, um, this just just can't get over how how close they got. And then I'm going to show you a couple of shots that were actually taken from inside the whale boat to show you. Now, these are humpback whales, so in the center of the picture, what that is, that white is the, the, the uh, fin of the whale. The big, uh, the humpbacks have the big fins. So uh, you can see they're right there with the whaleboat oars uh, sticking right above them. And then the, the baby went right underneath. Um, my brother as was the second mate, as I said, he was on the radio with the ship, and the ship was calling to him and saying, you should be heading back right now. It's time for you to head back. And he said, we're not going anywhere because there's whales right under the boat, and we don't want to stick the oars down in there. So, uh, and some more, you know, just some more photographs that were taken. Um, I think these were taken by our, the guys who are helping us with doing the filming with this. So, so that, um, yeah, th so as I said, it was uh, so many different things we learned, you know. Uh, we, we, the, the sound and feel and creaks and groans of the ship, um, how that, would have affected the story, um, the um, how hard we worked, how fast and nimble she was, what it was like to get those boats up and down. We both lowered the whale boats and raised them. And, you know, just the scary parts of seeing how close the whales were. So uh, when I reread the line, the chapter called The Line, which talks about what it's like to be in a whale boat right amongst the whales, I have a much more of appreciation for that. So there we are. And uh, what I'd like to do now is um, enter, uh, have Crystal come back up, and she is going to show us some wonderful artifacts that we actually have from the collection that have, are directly tied to Melville. Thanks, Mary Kay. We have a very, very small space up here to look at these objects, and, um, and we'll take questions whenever we're finished looking at the objects. And I already have a question, so. Oh, good. But I'll wait. I'm going to hold. <laughs> okay. I'll just put a pair on in just in All case right. we need. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. 
through putting on gloves whenever we hold or touch or move artifacts here at Mystic Seaport in order to um, keep the objects as protected as possible. Um, we always put on gloves and have clean hands. Um, so the first thing that we are going to look at here today is this um, box from the whale ship Akushnet. And Mary Kay, you wanna come over and tell us a little bit about this box? Well, one of the things that's interesting is that the title, uh, the name of the Akushnet is spelled with two T's. And uh, most of the time when we see it spelled, it's spelled with one T. And that's um, kind of interesting because spelling was not standardized in Melville's time. So he wrote a letter about Shakespeare and he spelled Shakespeare three different ways in the same letter. Uh, his, his, his mother's name he spelled in different ways at different times. Um, and even his own last name, we spell Melville with an E at the end. Uh, when he was young, they didn't have the E and then his brother uh, added the E later on. Um, and the whole family's name just changed that way. So that's, I, I like this fact that it's a Kushnet. Um, it's also when Melville sailed, the vessel was rigged as a ship, the Kushnet was. Um, and the Morgan too, when she was first built, was rigged as a ship. And then later she was rigged as a bark and then back to the ship. So you can tell that this was a, um, the ship. And what this box is, is it was the sort of strong box and it would have held um, any money that they took, either um, sort of letters of credit or um, also any type of bullion that they might have had with them would have been held in it, as well as the ship's papers, including the crew list. There was two crew lists. One was left behind. One was filed when they left and left behind. Um, and that one is the one that's actually on display in the New Bedford Lily Museum. And then the other one was um, that they kept with them. And if somebody ran away, they would cross it off. And then if somebody jo um, joined, they would add their name. And they would also clip a little thing to it, a desertion certificate, a testifying that somebody had run away. And that's actually at the National Archives in uh, um, Waltham, Massachusetts. So that would all have been kept inside this box. Um, and uh, I. I just think it's amazing that we actually have the real box that was on the Krishnet. I have to say, whenever I'm doing tours of our collection, um, especially with teachers, and especially if I know we have literature teachers, we always make a pit stop at the, at the <laughs> box. And um, that's always it's a really fun part of a vault tour. So the next object we have, and I'll hold it up for you if you want, and then you can talk about it. This is pretty special, I understand, right? Yeah. So. This is actually, this is the only thing in our entire collection that we have that actually belonged to Melville. So this is a print um, of a Turner, JMW Turner painting uh, about uh, the whaler Erebus. And um, that we have the, the, like the Melville Society has a whole pile of engravings that Melville owned um, that now that people can come look up at the Melville Society archive, which is up in New Bedford. But um, those were handed down and that were handed down in the family. But everybody was, most of them are kind of boring. They're, they're scenes of, um, of chalets and uh, castles in Europe. Uh, they're not very interesting. And they had always hoped there would be something, uh, something to do with whaling. And the fact that he owned this is really wonderful. And the provenance is, uh, we know who gave it to, to, to um, the, the museum, and we know that that person's connection to Melville. So that's pretty amazing. And Turner really inspired him. Um, is, he saw Turner's live, Turner's um, paintings are usually enormous. Um, and he saw them when he was in England. And um, then he, when he was writing, especially his poetry later, there's a lot of references to Turner. Turner sort of inspires him. But, but Turner is also an influence on some of the descriptions of Moby Dick. Um, that, and uh, so that's part of this. And then underneath is uh, a, a Melville signature. Um, and so of course that happened a lot. I mean, for Melville scholars, seeing a signature is kind of good and also kind of awful because we know it was cut out from something. And so um, collectors uh, would cut signatures out from letters and throw the letters away. And we would give anything to see those letters now. But they would, um, they would be tipped into books. Uh, there was a, a very a fad in the late 19th century, um, well, in middle and late, where they would get a book by an author and tip in, which means like glue in, various things, including the um, uh, uh, signatures. So I don't actually know the provenance of the signature. I know they're, right now they've been uh, framed together. I know the provenance of the, the print, but so pretty cool. Wow, thanks. All right, so the last object that we're gonna take a look at, 
Um, and by the way, while we're looking at this objects, I forgot to mention that you can at home go check out some objects in our whaling resource set and the Akushnet box, in fact, is in our whaling resource set on Mystic Seaport for Educators. So that's educators.mysticseaport.org and uh, go to resource sets and you can check out the Akushnet box and uh, see lots of great photos that you can zoom into. But the last thing that we'll look at is this um, very heavy thick harpoon here. Oh, don't be scared, Mary. <laughs> um, so, so tell us a little bit about this. So this is a double flu iron. And um, when Melville was at sea, uh, he was uh, sailed um, between 1840 and 1844. And the only type of, of harpoon they uh, used on the ship he was on would have been a double flu like this. Um, and later on, the to toggle iron comes out. So the toggle iron makes a small hole going in, and then it toggles open. But uh, that isn't uh, starts to be seen on ships until after 1848 with uh, Lewis Temple, the New Bedford ship smith, who, who sort of perfects it and then sends it out to sea. Um, so the trouble with this type of harpoon was that it made such a big hole going in that it pulled out very easily lost more whales than they caught with this type of harpoon. Um, they, there's many figures that are given. You know, some people say they only caught one in seven of the whales who went after. Some say they caught one in four. I, I don't know enough to know which of those figures is, um, is accurate, but it does sound like with this type of harpoon, they lost more than they caught. So because of its pulling out. So this, this, double, this one isn't directly related to Melville, but it uh, gives you a sense of the whale, of the harpoons. This is an 1835 harpoon, and uh, so certainly was around at the time that Melville was whaling. Yeah, so a good example of the type of thing yeah. that, um, that might have been used. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Well, now we're going to take any questions from the audience. So we have a small audience of dedicated teachers here in the studio. Thank you guys for coming. Um, so we'll take questions from here. And I'm also going to go back to my computer. I've been keeping tabs of what's happening online. And so if you are watching at home or in your classroom and you have any questions, please um, type them in. Um, you might be experiencing difficulty. If you can't do that, you might not be signed into your Gmail account. So sign into your Gmail account. And there's a little set of squares at the top right hand corner of your screen. If you click on those squares, you'll find um, a box that says Q&A. So click on Q&A and you should be able to activate the right side of the screen where you'll see questions coming up. All right, so any questions here from the audience? You mentioned before that the Akushnet had been rigged as a, as a ship, then a bark, and then a ship again. Can oh, no, explain? I'm sorry. The, uh, the a Morgan was rigged as a ship, then a bark, and then a ship again. The Akushnet only made four voyages, and uh, she was wrecked on her fourth voyage. So the Akushnet remained the ship her whole time. Yeah. Can you explain the difference between the ship and the bark? Yes, um, and uh, maybe I can go back and... Uh, um, no, I don't know if I can do that. But um, so the, um, the uh, 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 ship... So um, most of the whale ships had three masts. Occasionally they only had two masts, but most of them they had three masts. And a ship has square soles on all three masts. So the square soles are, sa are sails that go across the ship. They're in fact not very square in shape. They're sort of rectangle in shape. But if your ship is like this, the square soles go across it. So they're square or perpendicular to the ship. That's where the name comes from. And um, so a, a ship or a full rigged ship would have them on all three masts. And uh, then late, uh, later on, they, on a bark, they had the square soles on the first two masts, and then the last mast had a four and a half sail. So that gave the ship more maneuverability. So they were discovering that with the full rig ship, that they weren't able to get quite as close to the whales, and their desire was to bring the big ship as close to the whale as possible, and then lower the boats uh, so that they had a better chance of the boats reaching the whales. So. Um, so as I said, that the ship was an early in the early part of the 19th century, almost all vessels rigged as ships. Uh, then they then they have this innovation in the second half of the 19th century where they start to go to barks. And then the Morgan at the very end of her career was a ship again. Um, and I'm not exactly sure why that happened. Um, it may just be that whaling was starting to die. She was used for other things. Um, she was in the movies, and then she became. Uh, a place that people could visit in New Bedford on Colonel Colonel Green's at his estate, so that it may have been why that happened. Other questions? Anybody have any questions? 
Yes. Were Melville and Hawthorne contemporaries age-wise or just in terms of moving in the same circles at the same time? So he just asked if Melville and Hawthorne were contemporary um, contemporary age-wise or uh, just uh, 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 in terms of you know their their friendship and, and the area they lived in. So uh, Hawthorne was actually 15 years older than Melville, and Hawthorne was um, established. Uh, he was an established writer before Melville was. So Melville looked up to him as um, a, a sort of a mentor. He was his older, you know, an older, more established author. Um, there's a lot of debate about the Melville Hawthorne relationship. Um, of course, it you know it, it fascinates everybody, and partly the the thing is that we only have the letters that um, Melville wrote to Hawthorne. We don't have well, I'll, I'll I'll qualify that in a second, but we don't have many letters that Hawthorne wrote to Melville, and um, so people have seen it as a one-sided relationship. But partly what happened was that Melville got very depressed after his books weren't selling. He went to a deep depression. His wife wrote about that. And um, he, at one point, burnt all his manuscripts. That's why there's no manuscript to, to uh, Moby Dick. And he also burnt letters. So he burnt the letters he had received from Hawthorne, but um, uh, the letters that he wrote to Hawthorne, Hawthorne kept. So it's partly just a thing of history that uh, we have th those letters. Um, and so some of that one-sided relationship, I think, is only because we only see half of it. But there must have been something coming from um, Hawthorne. I mean, Melville calls Hawthorne your, your joy-giving and exaltation-breeding letter. That certainly does not sound like somebody who's trying to distance himself. You know what? You know, certainly, Melville's reading it as as an unspeakable security as meaning this moment on kind of your having understood. You know, he sees him as having understood, as as giving him joy in the letter. Um, when I was a graduate student, there were no at that point none of the letters from um, um, uh, Hawthorne to Melville existed. And then in upstate New York, three boxes were found in an, um, an upstairs, uh, 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 somebody there found them up in their, up, I guess, in their attic. And they ended up, they, they're all at the New York Public Library now. But there was finally, finally a letter from <laughs> Hawthorne to Melville. So Melville scholars were unbelievably excited. And then it turned out to be just something that said something like, I understand you're going down, you're going to town. If you could, when you do, there's supposed to be a pair of shoes coming in for Julian. Oh. Would you mind picking them up? It's something like that. It was very disappointing. You know, we all are wondering, where is the letter that says, uh, either stay away from me, you're bothering me, or that says, you know, how wonderful Moby Dick is. But, uh, what was that? And all you got was shoes. Yeah. <laughs> Another interesting thing, I mean, when I was uh, first a graduate student, my major professor, who was Harrison Hayford, uh, he was, um, he's the general editor of the Northwestern Newberry edition of, of, of Melville's writings. He said that he thought that we would never find more Melville stuff, that Melville was the most famous American writer, and that, you know, anything that was Melville related would, was probably been found. But when in those three boxes, uh, that were found in upstate New York. There was also an alternate ending to Bartleby, Melville's most famous story, uh, short story. Um, and then later on, um, his Milton, people had had long figured out that his Milton was probably the Hilliard and Gray edition of Milton, but um, it was thought long lost and they weren't even sure. And then his Milton surfaced. It was indeed the Hillier and Gray edition, which was pretty amazing. But uh, that surfaced, and then his Dante surfaced. So as I said, the most important books were the Bible and Shakespeare. Both of those existed. They're at the Houghton Library in Harvard. But then the Milton and Dante. So things keep hoping even more. Yeah. Uh, so anybody else have questions? Yes. I was hoping, could you show us your edition of Moby Dick? Because you, you were showing it to us earlier, and it's so colorful and um, I assume you read the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I only had this, brought this edition with me because I was teaching today, uh, teaching Moby Dick today. I think I've read it from cover to cover probably about 35 times. Um, I, when I was a student, I hated it if I could tell that the, uh, that the teacher was familiar with the book with whatever book it was that we were reading, but had not recently reread it. And I vowed that if I became a professor, I would always reread the book, which sometimes I regret that vow. But uh, <laughs> but um, so this is a newer edition. This is the Longman Critical Edition. And what uh, it's been done in this edition is that um, the parts that 
uh, were cut from the British edition. When the British edition was published, there was a lot of uh, editing that was done, um, and uh, that was they the British um, uh, cut the British editors cut out parts that they thought were either blasphemous or too sexual. And um, so this edition has the stuff that was cut in the British edition in gray, and the rest is in black ink. So it's a very interesting edition to work with. So it's the one I've been teaching with more lately because I'm, I, I'm intrigued for the students to respond to that. Um, so anyways, I, they, they're color coded now. I used to just put the tabs in, and then I was like, why did I put that tab? So now they're yellow. Or, <laughs> the yellow means sailor talk. The pink means cannibal talk. So yeah, yeah. I forget the provenance of the the accretionate box. How did we end up? I don't with actually that? know the Do provenance know? of the accretionate box. I don't box. know. Uh, we need to find out. I don't know that. <laughs> yeah, I know the provenance of the. We have that. that yeah, is one of yeah. Them. Because uh, Kushnet uh, was lost on her fourth voyage. Melville was on her first voyage. She was on the maiden voyage, but on her fourth voyage, she went uh, aground, um, and uh, was the vessel was lost. So then she never made more than four voyages. Yes. Well, I'm kind of wondering. Uh, if, uh, if Melville uh, was uh, sort of influenced uh, by the, the incident of, of, of mutiny aboard the ship that his cousin sailed on, why did he sort of contextualize the, the, the story of Billy Budd uh, in, a, in a different era? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so he asked uh, why, if Melville was inspired by the mutiny on the Summers, um, that Gert Gansevoort, his cousin, was involved in, why did he contextualize it in a different era? And, you know, it, uh, there's different theories about that. I mean, one of them is that it was so close to him that he, you know, that um, I, this is a theory. I don't know, you know, I'm sure scholars would disagree with it. Uh, some would agree, some would disagree, but that he, even though it's been 50 years, that happened, that incident happened in 1842, um, and um, He's working on, on uh, Billy Budd when he dies. He dies in 1891, so 50 years later. Um, but that to keep it from, you know, suggesting his family that it inspires Billy Budd, but that he he sets it in the British in the British uh, uh, vessel and, um, and and in a different period, like you say. Yeah. So I, I I'm not sure, but it might be that just it's still too kind of tough because Gert Gensport was one of the ones who. Um, he was in that drumhead court, which was only composed of three people, Alexander, Slidell, McKenzie, Kurt Gansford, and one other man, one another officer. And they put those three men to death. And the more evidence that's looked at it, it just doesn't seem like they were really planning a mutiny. It seems like Philip Spencer, you know, was a kid who had a wild imagination. It was like, oh, you know, he makes lists of who's with us and who's against us and things like that. Um, and um, he, uh, interestingly, he went to Wesleyan University. So we have a, a connection uh, right uh, here in Connecticut to him. So, yeah. Okay. Actually, a Billy Budd question on Jeopardy last night. Oh, really? <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember it, but I heard Billy Budd. Wow. <laughs> any other questions? And I don't, I don't have any questions coming in from online. So, yeah. So, well, so, thank, thank, yeah. Yeah. thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you here this afternoon. Um, there's a, there are quite a few resources um, that Mary Kay is the star of on the 60 Port for Educators. If you're interested in learning more, you can listen to um, a couple of lectures. Um, one about whaling on under the Lex Lectures and Scholars feature on Mystic Seaport for Educators. You can um, listen to her lecture about whaling or um, a tour of the Charles W. Morgan. And it's a very unique tour. You'll never hear a tour like this again because it was in July of 2012 when the Morgan was undergoing restoration. So at that moment in time, the Morgan will never be the way it was at that time whenever you um, things were kind of taken apart and you were talking about things that you're seeing, you're hearing hammers and nails in the background. Um, so it's a really, a really great resource to listen to. This will also be archived on Mystic Seaport for educators too. So go check it out, educators.mysticseaport.org. And thanks for tuning in. Bye. <laughs> I feel like this probably should have some music. Yeah. <laughs> some this old house music. Or... <laughs> we don't know how to end. <laughs>